begin this evening. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, your blessings. We thank you for your presence with us in our lives. As we live for you, we're thankful that your Holy Spirit guides us and directs us uh, to live in a manner that is pleasing in your sight. We pray that you'll continue to transform us uh, by the knowledge that you give to us and direct us uh, to be more and more faithful to you. Guide our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I think Jaden is at home watching. So, so greetings to Jason. Uh, Jaden. Uh, Jason. Jaden. So thank you for being here. And uh, some others as well. Um, I'm going to begin just with where we ended up last time. And this is really most important for you to know. Of all this unit, if you know this, you know exactly what's happening on the cross. It has to be... The first thing that is, pertains is the who. And we say he must be the son of God and he must be the son of man because he's mediating between God and man. So he's the perfect mediator because he is fully God and he is fully man. And if he was anything, if it was just God come down, there's no connection with us. There's no representation of us. So he is, he's perfect. He's the perfect one to mediate our salvation on the cross. And then the how question of how does he do this? And the answer, first off, is that God gave his son voluntarily, and Jesus gave himself to die upon the cross. It's voluntary. And the voluntary aspect is the aspect that communicates the love of God and the love of Jesus Christ. Jesus was not forced to go to the cross. Uh, He was not compelled to go to the cross. He was not taken by the Jews and the Romans and us, for that matter, and nailed to the cross by against his will. He willingly came to be our representative. That's a divine appointment. You can't decide that you're going to represent Uh, the human race, just because you want to. It has to be a divine appointment, and he is appointed by God uh, to be our representative there upon the cross. He then takes our place as a substitute. He takes our place. It's as if we stand in judgment before God, and God pronounces that we are guilty, and Jesus takes our place. And then he takes our sin and our punishment. That's the how you go about the cross. You have to have all of those elements. You know, and I say this because people talk about, you know, and especially kids at school talk about, and I say, how are you saved? And they say, well, I'm saved by believing in Jesus. I said, exactly. That's exactly right. And how does that save you? And they say, well, Jesus, uh, he died on the cross. I said, well, what did he do when he died on the cross? Well, they don't know. And you don't know unless you start reading your Bible and start uh, understanding the truth of what God is saying. But all of that is, is what happens for the atoning work to be done. Then the what happens. So you got the right who and the right how. And then you have to have the, the right what happens. And there's propitiation. That's where... God pours out his wrath. And the word propitiation is a better word. Sometimes in, the, in your Bibles, the translation will be satisfaction. That's an appropriate word, but propitiation is better because satisfaction doesn't really answer the question, satisfaction of what? Propitiation is satisfaction of wrath. And it is wrath satisfied. It is perfect justice. So all of our sins are scooped up and and imputed to Jesus Christ, and then God pours out his eternal wrath on his eternal son to obtain our eternal forgiveness. At which point God is at peace. He's reconciled. And it's not just at peace, and this sounds like kind of a weak word. It's not a weak word for God, but it, it's, he's inclined toward us. It's, it's, he is our friend. There's friendship. This is what was accomplished at the cross because God has no more wrath toward us and he's not neutral. 
he is inclined toward us, inclined to love us. The whole thing is the love of God, but he's, that love is really expressed. And, and then we are redeemed. So first is the Father and the Son in the act of propitiation. The second is the Father being at peace. And the third is what, what happens for us. We are redeemed. The ransom is paid. The, that which holds us in captivity, in slavery, is fully paid. And we're set free from sin and death. And that's the work of our salvation. I always like to say we are saved by works. We're saved by works. Not our works, but the works of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And the, the whole of human history is, is to reveal the God who works for us, the God who graciously comes to us. It, it's not a, a, a cooperative work, and I'm not taking anything away from our, the way in which we are saved. We come to an understanding of the gospel. We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are saved. And if we didn't have the Bible telling us all this what goes on, we would never know. We have to be told this. Because we just say, well, I believed in Jesus, and because I came to Jesus and I brought myself to Jesus, Jesus is the one who saves me. And I don't know how he saves me, but he just does. And that's what we would say. But we don't say it like that. We say this is, this is God. And that's why when salvation is talked about, there's an aspect of which God says, well, I, I chose you, I elected you, and I chose you, and I pre predestined, pre-decreed that I would save you before anyone was ever born. Before Adam and Eve were, ever were living and sinned. And when you have this God foreknowing, God electing, God choosing, and God determining that that's going to be the way it is, that means the origin of our salvation before time has to be in God. And not only is the origin in God, but the work is in God, and the glory is to God. Because it's his work from start to finish. And that's an important truth that he wants us to know. Even when we're in Galatians, it's important uh, for us to understand that our justification is not accompanied with even wonderful works that we might do according to the law. It's the working of God. So, so this is the victory of the cross. Now you say, well, this is wonderful. And when Christ died, all of this is accomplished. It's all accomplished. Is it mine? Not yet. This is the accomplishment of the work is here. This, this doesn't mean that, and I'll just use myself for example, since I'm a believer in Jesus Christ and saved, it doesn't mean that because the Father chose me before the foundation of the earth and Christ died for me that I'm born into this world saved. You say, well, how can that be? And I say, well, you need to meet God. But it, it means that I need to be saved, and I will be saved. In fact, it means that that choosing and that dying and the Holy Spirit comes to apply that, and it's when I come to faith and trust in Jesus Christ that all of that work is charged to my account, that's applied to me. And so I'm born into this world a sinner that needs to be saved. I'm in the pit of despair, we talked about. And I need this salvation work to be accomplished for me. And so I come to Jesus, I trust in Jesus. And the Lord says, all who come to me, I will in no wise cast you out. So sometimes people say to me, well, how do I know that I'm of the elect? And how do I know that Jesus Christ, when he died, died effectively for me? How do I know that? And I say, all who come to him, the Lord says, I will never cast you out. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It doesn't say you might be saved. It's, it's a finished work and the working of God. So that's why this, this is really the most important thing of all we're going to talk about, about living the Christian life. All of that's important. This is the foundation of that, the finished work of Christ. 
Now, there's a, a statement. I hope I can turn and find this. I've been reading through Galatians chapter 5 because I'm preaching through Galatians chapter 5. But he talks and he says something interesting. He says, oh, i got to get this. Um, in verse 5, he says, For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. We eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. What is the hope of righteousness? What are we waiting for? And again, when we are saved, we are justified. We are justified. That's a point in time where the righteousness where the righteousness of God is charged to our account. We are by faith. When we come to a faith, this is what happens to us. We are justified. At that point in time, we are declared to be righteous. That declaration of righteousness ha has a hope. Is that me? That sounds like me. When I hear that, I go, I started checking out everything. Hope. What is the hope? And it's the hope of this righteousness. You're declared righteous. What is the hope of that righteousness? Well, the hope of that righteousness is everything that comes with it, which includes our sanctification. And our glory. The hope is all of this. Because we are declared to be righteous. This again is where I said, this is at the beginning of the race and you're declared a winner. At the beginning of the race. You say, well, you shouldn't do that. You should wait until the race is over until you get here. Here we should be declared righteous. I said, no, that's not what happens. We're declared righteous. And then God pulls out this whole process of sanctification. This is holy. So we're righteous, and we're going to be holy, and we're going to be glorified. And, and that is the hope, and it's guaranteed by this righteousness. Declare, if you're declared righteous in Jesus Christ, you're going to be sanctified, and you're going to be glorified. There's not, it's not maybe you will be sanctified, and maybe you'll be glorified, and maybe it will be completed, there's no maybe about it. It's a finished work, and that's what God is doing in our lives. He's setting us apart to have the holiness of Jesus Christ, to be more and more like Jesus Christ. When we die and when we go to heaven and when Jesus Christ returns and we are transformed and glorified, that glory is the finished work. It's, it's when the whole of our salvation is complete. So, you know, you, you look at this and you say... When I first believe and you have righteousness declared to you, the righteousness of Christ, it's guaranteed from that point on. And you can't add to it and you can't take away from it. It's guaranteed that you are righteous before God. God is at peace with you. The, the price is paid. You've been set free from sin and death. All of that is applied to you and it is yours. And it's yours with a hope. And we say, well, it would be much easier if it was just all accomplished at one time, if we would be justified, sanctified, and glorified all at one moment. But that's what salvation is. We've just pulled salvation apart here. That's what salvation is. And I, I just love to say, you, you can pull this. If you pull this apart, then it looks S-A-L-V-A-T-I-O-N. You've just pulled it apart. And it's pulled apart over time. And the holiness is the part that is pulled apart over time. God wants us to walk in the Spirit. We're going to talk about that on Sunday morning. But He wants us to walk in the Spirit. And He wants us to, to, to learn how to, to live with Him when we still have 
struggles with sin and still are going to die. I used to say, if Jesus defeated death, why do I have to die? And then I started to think, wait a sec. If Jesus Christ defeated sin, why do I have to sin? And the answer is because we are saved from those things. God wants us to walk through them. It's like a living theology lesson. That's part of our living theology lesson is to walk through sin and death. And I say to God, I'd rather not. And God says, well, then I got to take you home right now. <laughs> I say, well, I'd still rather not, but I, I'd, I'd rather you make me more holy now and, and glorified now, and I'd like to live my life really holy and glorified. I say, and God says, you will. But for now, I want, you, I want you to see the finished work of Jesus Christ. I want you to see what he's done. And I want you to see how it is you walk with him. And you walk by faith. You're saved by faith. You walk by faith. You live in hope of the faith of the coming of the Lord. You're living in all of those things by faith. And God says, there's a reason. I want you to trust me. I want you to live by faith. Adam and Eve walked away from living by faith. God said, don't eat the tree. That's the command. I, Faith always has substance to it. So that's the command. They turned around, they walked away from the command. We turn around and walk toward the command again. God says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And I want you to live in this sinful world, live for Jesus Christ, and while you do this, I'm going to make you holy. And we say, well, that, that would be amazing if you could do that, and he's going to do it for every single one of us. That's the wonderful truth. So this is the part of what God has done. Well, let me... Keep moving. What the cross did is it paid, the penalty of our sin is paid in full. You can look at that as the past. The power of sin is broken for us in the present. And the presence of sin one day will be removed. That's again looking at time. Penalty of sin paid in full at the cross. Paid in full. The power of sin is broken. We no longer must sin. We no, mo, we no longer are compelled by sin as a sin master that masters over us and tells us that I will, sin tells us what to do. I said, no, the power of sin has been broken. The presence of sin is still with us, but its power is broken. And the hope is, and the one the future is that the, the presence of that sin will be removed from us. Now, the way this happens is the way I draw this person. And I draw this with this part here. This is paid in full. This is the power over you is broken, and this will be removed from you. You are already new. So if somebody says, what is your, do you have two natures? I say, no, I don't have two natures. I have one nature. And I have the remnant of that other nature still present with me. Again, People talk about like the principle of the old nature with me. You can call it all kinds of things, but you're not a two nature person. That old nature has been broken and it will be removed. Jesus defeated it. We don't defeat it in this lifetime. Jesus defeats it. You want to have power over sin, you have power over sin by the presence and power of God. That's the only way to be delivered from the presence of sin, to know who you are in Jesus Christ. But that's, that, that's why I say that that's not the totality of this person when I, I put this down from the cross, because that, this is what happens in the negative sense with that old nature, but your new nature, we're going to talk about this new nature, it's made new as well. And we are made to be new, we're born again, we're made New. There's a newness of life. And because of this, you know, the battle is between this and this in the Christian life. 
And that's the battle you always are going to have. That's the battle between the old and the new. You also have the world around you. And you have the devil above you, so to speak. Spiritual presence. There's a spiritual attack by Satan and his host. The world about you to conform you to the ways of the world. The remnant of that nature in you. So it's a battle. The Christian life is a battle. It's, it's, it's not easy. When people say the Christian life is just an easy thing, you just become a Christian and you'll just live for Jesus and all will be well, I say, the Christian life is a battle. It's a, it's a struggle. It's a fight. And it's a fight not by our resources, but it's a fight that we fight by defending upon God. So this is an important part to know about this remnant of the old nature that is with us. So that's what it looks like. We've been saved to look like that. We've been saved from the natural man by grace, saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. And we're saved by grace. You've been saved through faith in that, not of yourselves, that it is the gift of God, not a result of works that no one should boast. So we're going to talk about how this new nature and new man lives. And that's when you talk about salvation, we've talked about this change. This is a death to life change. It's a change of nature. We have a good nature, a fallen nature where we are spiritually dead. Then we have a new nature where we are spiritually alive again. That's a change of our nature. So, here we go. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have come new. I want, I want to look at that statement because I want to look at it from the standpoint of what that new nature is called in the Bible and, and the terms that are used to speak of that new nature. So, here I'm just looking at this state of depravity, the natural man, the old nature, the man after the fall, still made in the image and likeness of God, but that image is corrupted. And the body and soul, but you're spiritually a spiritual being, but you're spiritually dead. And you go to this. You go to be a spiritual man with a new nature, and uh, this is your body, soul, and you are spiritually alive. And you have a, you are a spiritual being in connection with God. In connection with God. So, we are born again to be that change. We are change of nature to be that way. And I've we've gone through John 3 and Nicodemus coming and, and uh, really saying nice things to the Lord and the Lord saying to him, Nicodemus, you need to be born again. And unless you're born again, you, will, you can't see the kingdom of God and you cannot enter the kingdom of God. What comes first? Being born again or seeing or entering. And the text says, you need to be, Jesus said, you need to be born again so that you can see the kingdom of God. And you need to be born again so that you can enter the kingdom of God. And that has to do with the very first moment when you come to Christ. We come to Christ because we're born again. And when we're born again, we see it. I don't know if you had an experience where you were saved. I don't remember this kind of experience because I was saved when I was very long, so young, so I don't remember a lot about experiential stuff with me. But if you were saved as an adult, there was a time when suddenly you saw the truth. It may have been that somebody gave you the gospel a bunch of times and they said and tried to talk to you about it and you said, no, I'm not interested. I don't, I don't want to hear that. I don't, I'll do other things. He said, no, no, no. And then all of a sudden, you, it's like, whoa. And, and you see it. Why do you see it? Well, you see it because you've been born of God. God doesn't force our will. He changes our nature. When he changes our nature, we willingly, freely, willingly to come to him. We say, I see it. And then we say, 
I not only see it, but I can enter into it. You can't see the kingdom of God, nor can you enter the kingdom of God without the new birth. So we don't see it and enter and then are born of God. We're born to see and, and enter. And when we are born, we see it. So there's not people walking around who have been born of God and they're going to see it 10 years from now. When you're born of God, it would be like being a blind man. And uh, in Sunday school, we talked about the, the blind man in Jericho. When you, when you see, when Jesus touched their eyes, their eyes were open, they saw Jesus. They didn't see Jesus 10 years from, well, Jesus wasn't around 10 They didn't see him 10 minutes after that. They saw him immediately. And they followed him immediately. So, that's just, that's this new birth. When you are born of God, a baby, when a baby is born, they cry. They were alive before that in the womb, but when they are born, the, the, the birthing is they cry, and they breathe, and they see, and they live. When we're born of God, we see, and we breathe out faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and we live. And then we got that little thing hanging off like a one-sided earring or something. I don't know what that is, but it just looks. And that's the struggle we have. Well, I love this picture. I, I don't know. <laughs> I love this picture because it pictures, to me, the old nature and the new nature. And the little boy is the new nature, just born again, and the old nature is that old man, and for some reason that old man is pretty unhappy with that little boy. And, um, that might be grandpa and a grandson or something. I don't know what it is, but I just I think that's pretty cool. And, but the reason why I picture that is because the, if you look at that, you say, well, that's an uneven battle. I mean, if that man was really unhappy with that little boy, there's, you know, he could pop him on top of the head and he'd be in trouble. But there's, you say, well, I can tell you who can win that battle. But there's a very real sense in which that would, it's what it looks like when we become a Christian. Only it's the new that wins, not the old. You see, I, that's why I, when you look at that, you just say, well, I think the old, the old man is going to win. The old man is pretty strong. And I'll, I'll give you some formulas about that that I think are really true, but Let's just look at this. I'm going to take you to some, some Greek words. There's two words that are used in the Bible for old. And the first is archaeos, and it means old in time. The second one is paleos, and it means worn out. Of, of war, it's old in quality. It's like if you pick up a material of something and it's really old and you pick it up and, and it rips just because it's just, it's just old. It's just, you say, that's really old. And you say, that's what you mean is old in quality. You could also say that's old in time, but you're speaking of the quality because you just tore somebody else's thing that when you picked it up. And you go, oh, that's really old. Old in quality. It's also old in time, but the Bible uses both of those words and uses those, both of those words in reference to our nature. And I'll show you some verses with that. There's also two words for new. And neos means new in time. Same thing. Recent in existence, young. You look at that little boy and you say, he's new. He's not brand new, but he's new. New in time. He's he looks like, I don't know, maybe two or three years old, maybe four years old, I don't know. But he's young. And it's another of the same kind. And uh, the other word is new in quality. Same thing. It's kainos. It's new and improved. Superior innovations. When it talks about the new heavens and new earth, it uses the word kainos. New and improved. It doesn't mean 
new meaning another of the same kind. It doesn't mean brand new. New in time. The new, in he new heavens and new earth are going to be new in quality, new with superior innovations. We have no idea what that's going to be like. It's going to be so fascinating when we look at what God is going to do. I mean, we may travel the universe. I don't know what, we, we've got a lot of time. So we, we got time to do a lot of things. And God may make the whole of the universe fantastic. It's already fantastic. But life is here upon the earth, and I don't know what God, we're going to live on the new heavens and new earth, but the new heavens and the new earth. And God's going to burn the whole thing up and put it all back together. But it's new in quality. That's why I say, if you want to use these words new, again, if you smacked your car and you had a, a fender bender, you take it in to the dealership or take it into the place where they're going to fix your car, and you say, I'd like this to be new, made new. And what you mean is, I, I want it to be like it was when it was brand new. I want it to be brand new. So you, you probably would say, I want this to be neos. I want this to be new. And they say, okay. So they may take the old fender completely off and put a brand new fender on there that's new. And whatever else that was broken, new. And put it on so you get it back and you say, ah, that's just what I was thinking about. It's, this is new. If you said, I want this to be new in quality, you would come back and you would find all that same thing. It would look brand new and everything else, but you pull the car out and the car starts floating in the air. You say, oh, this is superior. I didn't know you were going to be superior innovations. So now I, don't, I not only have to drive the car, but if it's, there's traffic, I can just get up and go right over the top of traffic and then you know, get in front of all. Great. That's new with superior innovation. So let's look at what the Bible has to say. I put this up here so you can be remembering this. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if any man is new in Christ, he is a new in quality creature. Old in time things have passed away. New in quality has come. There's a qualitative newness New in quality. New and of a, its superior. What, what that tells you is when God saves us, we're not like Adam. We're not in a state of goodness. We're in a state of goodness with superior innovations. I mean, we are made new, superior to whatever it was before. And by the way, we'll be able to fly. It will be a superior innovation. That's how you can tell that you are glorified is when you start flying. Second Corinthians 5.17, that's a great passage. And you can look at those. I'll give you another verse. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 20 through 24. You laid aside the old in quality man, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, of deceit that you may be renewed, that means again in time, brand new, in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new in time, the, the brand new, which is in the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. So it's interesting, because you can think of your old nature as being old in time and old in quality. And you can think of your new nature as being new in time and new in quality. There's a quality difference. So when it says all things have become new, it's a, it's a, that's a qualitative difference. There's something different about being a Christian. And uh, I'll talk about that just a little bit, but there are superior innovations. And it is, we are made brand new because we were dead, now we're alive. That's brand new. But we're made new with the newness of quality, the newness of, of what God makes us to be in Christ. 
Are you through writing this down? If you're through, I'll, when you're through, I'll go on to the next thing. But uh, it's just, those are interesting terms, you know, that are used. And it, it's helpful. Sometimes it's helpful. And you don't have to know Greek. You know, there's so many, you know, study aids that are made. And a lot of times they'll, they'll tell you stuff like this. And that's why a study Bible is very useful good study Bible will tell you some of this kind of stuff that is new in quality, new in time, old in quality, old in time. Those, those are distinctions. And the reason why it's important to see that is because those Greek words say that. So some, you know, God wanted us to see the distinction in those, in those kinds of, of statements. So if you're a Christian, you're new and improved. You're not just made to be spiritually alive, you're spiritually alive with spiritual innovations. And part of that is you've got the Holy Spirit living in you. You've got a new, nat a new nature that desires God. Uh, you have the Word of God and the desire for the Word of God in your heart. Um, you know, you have the full forgiveness of your sins. You have the hope of holiness. You have the hope of glory. Um, these are all new things. And, you know, we're going to, you're going to experience one of those new things when you are glorified. I don't know if that's going to, you know, people, some of the kids went to, uh, on a, Puerto Rico, went to a trip to do some service for some churches. They had a great time, some kids from high school, uh, Horizon High School. And um, it was uh, a great experience uh, for them. Um, and, you know, one of them, they went to church, and this church was, they said, it's really different. A, a, a Spanish kind of church in Puerto Rico is different from the kind of church that we go to here because it's, it's much more active, much more, it's a lot more sound, and, and even when, they said, even when the preacher is preaching, people are, ah, yeah, oh, yeah, you yeah. <laughs> know. And, you know, if, if, if I was preaching and somebody shouted out, amen, I'd probably forget what I'm talking about. I'd like, you know, I, I'd just be, but it's like they, they kind of interact. And, and, uh, and one of them said, one of the students said, I could feel the spirit. And I know what she means by that when she says that, but she can't, you can't feel the spirit. I think when we're glorified, we will feel that change. I, that's the time when I think you're really going to experience what it's like for the old nature to be removed, for us to be glorified. And one of the reasons why we rise up in the air to meet the Lord is because the, you're going to know that's a new spiritual. You, you can't fly right now, and you can't rise up in the air. And when you start rising up in the air, you're going to know the Lord's come. And you, I think we'll rise up in the air, and I think we go right through this building. Don't mess with the paint because it took a long time to get that paint done. But we're going to go right through the building. Yes. I'm just making a comment here. So I am attending a lot of those Puerto Rican churches. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Here. And um, I'll tell you, when I sit in the pulpit here at Hillcrest and I listen to you expound the word of God, then I say, Well, I think I think it's I think it's the quiet sense of the Lord's presence is is a very important thing. I'm not saying we don't experience that. Right, right. But if the focus, you know, it's like you, you don't get yourself all lathered up and everything. That's right. Then you're not the spirit's not there. You're not feeling the spirit. Right. But. Well, people like to like to try to generate it. You know, they try to make it happen. By getting everyone all charged up. And, I, and you can use music to do that. You can use a lot of things to do that. Music is a wonderful thing. There's music that can calm you down. There's music that can make you jump around. And there's nothing around with jumping around. There's nothing bad about being calm. But with things that are spiritual, I think we need to be um, pretty discerning about what's, what's taking place. And you're going to know when you're glorified. Because you're going to hear a voice, I think you're going to hear your name called, and you're going to rise up in the air. And nobody needs to tell you that you're 
justified, sanctified, and glorified when you're rising up in the air. You're going to know it. And you're not going to be able to sin. And you're going to know it. And I just, I, uh, this, this, this transformation is, is a wonderful transformation that God is doing. And he really wants to do it slowly. And whenever you talk about sanctification and holiness, people say, oh, I'd like God to hurry up with me. I'd like he to make, him to make me holier faster than he seems to be doing. And I say, well, we all feel that way. I mean, we, we all would like to see the Lord's power and presence and transformation in our hearts and lives more and more as, you know, we're, we're impatient sometimes and impatient with the Lord even. that We say, you know, I should be further along in the Christian life than I am. But you, we're never, you never reach holiness in our experience. You're going to reach holiness in your, when we die, you will be completely holy then. That's in your experience, but I mean, I'm, I'm talking about in this life. Nobody in this life reaches the attainment of I am now holy. And I've met people who've claimed that, but I've never, they kind of sneak around with some words about it. But we're going to know. This is, this is a wonderful transformation that God has promised to us. And when he says we are new, he means new. And he means new in quality. And that quality, we've begun to experience. We've begun to experience, but not in full. There's a lot more. There's the hope of justification. That hope of justification is everything that is a consequence of being justified in Jesus Christ. And that means everything all the way to being glorified into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have more to gain. It's all ours, but it's more. And we have the inheritance of Jesus Christ when we get to heaven. So it's just, there's, it's wonderful truth. Okay, let me go on to... So here is this spiritual man, and his, this is the conflict. And uh, I'm going to give you some spiritual formulas, and we'll take a break. These spiritual formulas, the old is in conflict with the new. The old is in conflict with the new. So the Christian life is a conflict. When will it cease to be a conflict? I don't know. I talked to my dad when he was 92 years old, and he was still in the conflict. And, you know, that's what he talked about. And he said, I've, I've said a number of things to me, but you know, I, you know, I think wow, at 92, you should be well on the way to being holy. And, and I always respected and honored my dad, and I He's, he would be the example of what I would want to be. And I, I look at him as, as way along the way, and he looked at himself as not far enough along. Interesting. But this battle is on, and it's on in all of life to the very end. Let me give you the second one. The old is defeated, but powerful, very powerful. The old is defeated, but still powerful it still can enslave Christians. It still can enslave Christians. Okay, now get this one. This is, you got to know math to do this one because we have a greater than sign. This may be the extent of, my, of your, your uh, math knowledge, but uh, the old is greater in strength and power than the new. You say, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. You said this was defeated. I said it is defeated. You said it will be removed, you know, and the power has been broken. I say it has been broken. Don't ever underestimate this. Don't ever underestimate this. Because this is very powerful. And it's more powerful than this. More powerful than that. Well, let me give you the other formula that you need to have. I want to just leave that formula. Because you need this formula too. Old is not more powerful than the new plus the Holy Spirit. That's the key. That's what Paul is going to say in Galatians, is the key. That's the key. Our dependence upon the Lord Jesus Christ, our dependence upon the Spirit of God, our dependence upon God the Father, our dependence upon God. And if we just try the old against the new, 
the old can win. The old is more powerful than the new. Even in its defeated state, it is more powerful. You got the old and the world, the flesh, and the devil. And the flesh is very powerful. And when I, I've said this many times, but when I have opportunity to meet and counsel with people and they're struggling with some sinful issue, I, I, I never underestimate the, the power of that sinful issue. And I never, even if I'm not particularly challenged by that particular sin, I never look and say, um, I, I really, you know, I, I don't want to be a serial killer. I really don't. I, that, being a serial killer does not have any appeal to me. Murdering somebody has no appeal to me. You know, I don't, you know, there, there may be people who think I'd really like to kill some people or something. I don't know, but I don't, I just, whatever that is, I don't have that. But that seed is in my heart. I never say that I'm more powerful than my flesh because I say, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not going to murder anybody. I'm not going to murder a bunch of, I, murder is, is, is no for me. And I, I would, I say that for me. It's a no for me. But I don't think I'm more powerful than the, than the power of my flesh. And the seed of every sin is in your heart. The seed of every sin is in your heart. So don't ever talk to somebody who's struggling with sin and say, boy, I would never do that. Because you might never do that. It doesn't matter because the seed of every sin is in our heart. And that's why I say when I have a meeting with someone and they're struggling with some sin and I talk to them, tell them some of the ways that God can get them out, where God can get them out. I can't get them out, but God can get them out. When I have opportunity to talk about that, I never walk away and say, well, I'd never do that. And that, you know, even if I sat down, I, you know, I, I even went to the Oregon Penitentiary and sat down with a guy who was accused of, of uh, sex abuse with children. And I don't know if there was evidence of all that or whatever it was, but he was supposedly a Christian. And I didn't really know him, but I was asked to go visit him in prison. And I went and visited him. And... Um, Abusing children, you know, that's another thing. You know, I look at that and I say, I I don't, but I don't sit down and talk to somebody and not say to myself, I could be that guy. Because I, I never underestimate the power of sin. I never underestimate the power of Satan. And I never underestimate the power of this world to conform us. I never underestimate that. It, it's, you know, we need to be on guard. That is a very real issue and a very real problem. And I like these formulas because I like to know that the odds are all against me except for God. And that last formula is really important. The old against the new. If you say, well, I'm going to live for God, I'm just going to be the best person. I'm going to live as, as by my own strength, I'm living for God. And God will soon show you that you can't do it by your own strength. And we try. I always, always say, when I think about God and, you know, I, God and Moses. I mean, he's the one I think about the most when I think about this. You know, when he goes to be the deliverer, and he, he's doing everything he can to deliver the people. And it's almost like, you know, he could look up at God and say, I'm working hard. How am I doing? You know, I'm, I'm really doing. And, and, and God's up in heaven going, no. And so all the people come to Moses and they say, you know, thanks a lot for coming here, Moses. You've made everything worse for us. In fact, it's gotten so bad that we think that Pharaoh's going to use this to kill us all. He wants to get rid of us anyway, but he wants to kill us. And that's when Moses comes before God and says, I, I told you this didn't going to work. I told you this was a bad idea. Send in me. I'm not able to do it. And then God says, Moses, I want to show you what I do. I want to show you what, what I can do. And, you know, I think sometimes we live the Christian life and we look up at God and go, how am I doing? I'm working hard. I'm trying hard. I'm teaching juniors and seniors in high school. That ought, to, that ought to be worth something. You know, I'm doing this. I, and you look up and you feel it, you know, and going along pretty good and everything. And I think God is up in heaven going, mm. 
because he wants us to rely upon him. He wants us to depend upon him. And that's what Paul is talking about in Galatians 5. I mean, it's, it's really, to me, in chapter 5, it's just a really a wonderful chapter, but it's just so obvious in chapter 5, you know, that the Apostle Paul does not put down a whole host of rules that the Galatian Christians are supposed to be doing. The rule that he puts before them is you need to walk in love by faith in Christ. You, you, need to, you need to see the power of the Holy Spirit in you. And he uses the, and he speaks of the Holy Spirit in Galatians 5. He says this is, it's, you need to walk in the Spirit. And we're going to talk about that in church, but I mean that, I'll give you just a little preview, but I mean it's like when he says you need to walk in the Spirit, you know, you read that and you go, okay, how do you do that? Be led by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit. That's what we're supposed to do. So you go off. I could, I could just preach that sermon and say, okay, all of you go out there and walk by the Spirit. You all go, okay. You walk out of there going, how do, you, how do you walk by the Spirit? How are you led by the Spirit of God? Those are challenging statements, but he, he doesn't say, okay, all of you, you know, you need to do this thing, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I've got ten rules for you. I've got 25 rules. I've got 30 things I want you to do. I'll, I'll do all these things. You know, it'd be like putting the law down on him again. It's just a brand new law. But instead, he's, he's, he's talking about relying upon God. He's talking about drawing near to God, and he will draw near to you. He's talking about seeing the Spirit of God's power in our lives. It's not something we feel. It's something that he is. We have, the, we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us now, and we can't feel him. But he is in us, and he is in us to direct our lives. And it's fascinating, and, and we'll talk more about that on Sunday, but it, it's just fascinating to think about how you, you go about it. It's real easy for me to teach the words of Scripture. The harder part for me is to say, okay, this is how. how, how what does that involve because you, it's, you know, I'm just sort of surprised that Paul says, no, you don't, we're, don't do, we're not doing the law. And he doesn't do, we're not doing the, you know, civil ceremonial and just do the moral law. He's, he, we don't do the law. You think you're going to be sanctified and glorified and justified by the law, you're, you're seriously mistaken. You know, it, you, you need to come to God. You need to submit to God. You need to Depend upon him. The how-to is, is really important. Well, that's the spiritual struggle. We'll talk more about that, but we need to stop. because I've gone too long. You've been sitting for an hour, so we need to take a break. And Jaden, go get something to eat.
OK. <clears throat> um, let us proceed. Here's this spiritual struggle. And Jerry Bridges used to say, and the Puritans used to say, one of the things that you engage as you engage in this battle is you preach the gospel to your heart every day. You preach the gospel to your heart every day. Um, and you say, because of what Jesus Christ did upon the cross, propitiation, reconciliation, and redemption is true. I am forgiven. I am righteous. Uh, I, God is in me, and I am in God. This is all who I am. And by the way, if you look at Romans 6, verses 1 through 11, Kelly, if you look at all that, yes. Romans 6, 1 through 11, it's all about who you are. The Apostle Paul says, don't you know who you are? You've been baptized into the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit is taking up residence in you. You're asking, should I continue in sin? Don't you know who you are? If you knew who you were, you wouldn't ask, should I continue in sin? And then, then you get in... In verses, well, 1 through 11, 12, 13, and 14, then you get things to do. Don't present the members of your body as instruments of unrighteousness, but present the members of your body. The members would be your eyes, your ears, your mouth, your feet, your hands. What, what, don't present, give any of those things access to sinful things. You don't present, you don't present your body in your body parts, so to speak, to sin. And that's when, you know, if you talk to people, that's when they light up, especially when I'm talking to guys, and they light up when I start talking about the things that, oh, oh, that's what, that's, I said, if you don't have the power of knowing who you are, if you don't have the power of God, you'll never do those things. You know, guys come and talk to me, they want to get away from a particular sin, and, they, and, I, and they, <clears throat> I say to them, you know, you've already tried to get away. It's, it's your, if they're Christians, it's your new nature against your old nature. You've already tried. And when you look at, well, who am I? That directs your mind to say, well, what is my power base? You know, where do I get my strength and power from so that I can go and do these things? If you don't have Romans 6, 1 through 11, there's no sense talking about 12, 13, and 14. Because that's what they come and talk to me about. They said, I've been trying to do, you know, stop doing what I'm doing. I've stopped sinning. And I, I just, I get, it seems like I get called back into it. And, I, and then suddenly I find myself doing the things I hate. I say, well, that's Romans chapter 7. But Romans chapter 6 is this, you know, know who you are. And that's a part of what you do when you preach the gospel. Jerry Bridges used to lo love to say that a bunch of times. Preach the gospel to your heart every day. That doesn't mean you're becoming a Christian every day. It means you're preaching Jesus Christ to you. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's always going back to the cross. That whole state, all of that statement is, I've been crucified with Christ. Now I live, but I live by faith in the one who loved me and gave me. You're back at the cross. You start in the cross, you get back at the cross. Because it's, it's all about what Christ is doing in us and through us. regarding exactly what you're just talking about. He said, this is a fact. It's not a feeling. Yes. And, and he was mentioning some like holiness movements and things like that where they try to make it a feeling when in fact he said, they're going the wrong direction. This, right. this, is, this is a fact. Yeah. Just like we were born into Adam before we became born again. That's a fact. Yes. And we're led by truth. We're led by the facts. That's what's wrong with our society. Our society throws out the truth and then says, just, just, you know, determine truth with your feelings. Feelings are not leaders. Your feelings can lead you anywhere. You may think that you're a donkey, but you're not a donkey. But you can feel like you are a donkey sometimes. Or you may think you're just corn pone stupid or something. You're not corn pone stupid. You, you can, your feelings can lead you anywhere. But where does the truth lead us? That's the question. And that's what Paul's talking about. He said, you know, and that's why in Galatians, stand firm in the freedom. You have to stand. The Christian, is, the Christian life is taking a stand. 
And God intended it for it to be that way. It's not always going to be that way. When you get to the new heavens and new earth, I'm telling you, it's going to be easy to be a Christian. It's going to be easy. It's going to be according to your nature. It's going to be... Nobody's going to ask, what does it mean to love other people? And what does it mean to love God? Because you'll know. It'll be easy. This life is a battle. And I just... And so it's a battle that God determines to win. So the first thing is know who you are in Christ. This is, I would say, the suggestions. This goes back to, and you depend upon the power of God. How do you depend upon the power of God? Well, prayer is a means by which you do that. Knowing who you are, the scripture is a means of knowing who you are. You don't know who you are by looking in the mirror. You don't look, know who you are by taking your pulse. You know who you are by reading the scriptures. And it'll tell you what you used to be. And it'll tell you what you are now. And it'll tell you what it is to be made new and renewed and brand new and new in quality. It tells you all of that. But you can't live the Christian life without power. And that power comes from God. And God can give us power, I love to say this, in any number of ways. He could give us spiritual body, you know, spiritual body power packs. that We charge up every night, we plug it in like we plug our cell phones in. Plug the cell phone in, powered up, you get up in the morning, cell phone's ready to go. It could, you could have that. I often say we could have an angel that greets us every morning. That'd be scary. But, you know, it could be an angelic alarm clock. You know, the angels are going, ding a ling a ling a ling you got to get up. And, you know, okay, okay, okay. And the angel, you know, takes his angelic wand and touches us with it, and we're empowered to live for him. He could give us power any way he wants to. He could give us all the power we need when we're first saved. Instead, what he wants is he wants our daily dependence upon him. Daily dependence upon him. And so that means prayer. And it means closet prayer, which is a good thing. Closet prayer where you are in your secret place where it is all quiet and you're talking to God. That's, that's a wonderful thing. But you should also have driving your car prayer. That's a great place to pray as well. Washing the dishes, prayers. <laughs> Everything you're doing, prayers. I mean, God delights when we depend upon him. And, you know, we raise our kids to be, in, uh, you know, self-sufficient. That's kind of a weird thing. But we raise our kids to be, I don't want to be tying Will and Katie's shoes right now. I mean, you know, and telling them what clothes they need to wear every day. And I don't, want to, I don't want to be telling them, you know, how to do everything, where they just come to me all the time, and they're just, I'd say, don't, look, tie your own shoes. Learn, I, you know, I taught them how to tie their own shoes. That was before, in, that was right after the Civil War. We didn't have Velcro yet, but, you know, so we had to tie, you know, actually tie the knots and everything. But, <clears throat> but anyway, you teach them to tie their own shoes and you teach them to clean their own room. You teach them to do what they need to do and you teach them and you want them. You feel, hey, they're, they're coming along. They're coming along and everything. But really you're teaching them to not be independent. You're teaching them to be more and more dependent upon the Lord if you're teaching them you, the gospel and all the rest of that along the way. So I'm not saying we're just teaching them to be independent beings. But God delights to tie our shoes. You know, he, he, he wants us to depend upon him. To tie my shoes. He never says, you know, I, I, want, I want you to, you know, you, I want you to do something. You don't, don't come for me the little things. Come for me for the big things. That's not what God says. God's interested in every part of our life all the time. And he's really interested when we, the first thought that comes to our mind when we face a difficulty is not, mm, what am I going to do? But the first thought is, mm, what does the Lord want me to do? 
Lord, I need your help. The Lord loves it when we come to him and say, I, 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 I cannot, you have to help me. I need your help. I need your help now. I don't need your help later. I, I, I need now. I, I'm facing a difficult thing. Everything is difficult for us. But we need the power of God. And God is, we get the power of God through his word. We get the power of God by depending upon him, by faith. We get the power of God by the spiritual presence of God. And that's the myst- there's a mystical in the, in the sense of, you know, I can't really put my arms around that. I can't reach out and touch that. that, that it, it is God who empowers us to live for him. And the more you ask for power and the more you ask for his resource, the better off you are. And the better you see your weakness and his strength, the more you're going to learn how to live the Christian life. And I know that sounds kind of interesting because in life we teach people to stand on their own two feet. In the Christian life, we teach us that we are not sufficient, that there's something lacking in our own flesh, in our own, even in our new nature, is made to depend upon God. It's made not to act independently of God. Our new nature is made to be acting in, in concert with God. It's maybe not the right word, but it's... it's, it's it's independence upon him. And so many times we're on our own. I mean, I'd like to say I always am dependent upon the Lord, but there's a lot of times when I'm struggling to do something and, and I think the Lord's looking down from heaven at me going, have you done enough? And it's like I cry back up, not really. I'm, I'm still busy. I'm trying to get this right and do the right thing. And the Lord says, keep going. Until finally we say, I can't. Uh, I need your help. And the Lord never, never says, the Lord never says to someone who says to him, I need your help, no. No. I'm not going to help you. That just never happens. And the Lord never says, you've come to me too many times, and I'm not going to help you this time. It just never happens. We are dependent beings. That's why I love to say, if God had a heart attack, we'd all die. Everything would die. Trees would die. Everything would immediately die. Everything would immediately fall apart. Everything would just start drifting apart. So we are absolutely dependent beings, and our natural, we're at our natural best. We're at our natural best when we are most dependent upon God. And when Adam and Eve were told, do not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they should have both fallen down on their faces and said, God, help us. God, help us. And when God gave the children of Israel the law, they all said, everything you have commanded, we will do. Everything you've commanded, we will do. They should have, instead of saying that, they should have said, God, help us. We can't do this. You've given us the commands. You have to give us the power. And the same thing is true in the Christian life. You've given us a new nature. You've given us the Holy Spirit. You've given us a heart for God. You've given us full forgiveness. You've given us a baptism into the body of Christ. And God in me and I in God. You've abiding presence of the Father with us. The abiding presence of Jesus Christ with us, in us. The indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit with us. There's just wonderful blessings that God has given. And he's brought us into union. The more I think about the Christian life, the more I think the Christian life is a life of relationship with God. It's not a relationship for God. It's a relationship with God, in God, by God. And the more dependent we are upon God, the better off we are. Third thing is, you know, your, you know who you are. So what is, this is Romans 6. Know who you are. Depend upon the Lord. That's faith. But as you depend upon him, you're depending on him for the power and, and cry out and ask him for the power. And then the presentation is you obey by his strength. Put off and put on. 
And the whole of the Christian life has to be put off and put on. If you just do one thing, you're not, you're not doing enough. <laughs> you're not doing the right thing. If this is your nature and it looks like this, and you just say, well, I'm putting this off. If you're just doing and say, I'm not going to do this ever again. That's what people usually do with a, a slavery to sin problem as a Christian. I'm never doing this again. So then I say to them, so what is your Bible reading like? It would be really nice if every time I said, what is your Bible reading like? They go, ding, 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 ding. They go, whoa, that would be real. I should probably just be standing here so I can touch it every once in a while and make it go. <clears throat> anyway, but if they say, I'm just not going to do that. So I say, well, what is your prayer life like? I said, well, no, 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 I, I, I don't want to talk about that. I, I, I want this to go away. I said, it's not going away. It's a continual battle. And it, if you're going to deal with your life, you have to not only say no to this, but you have to say yes to this. And you can't just say yes to this and not say no to this. It, you, you got to deal with who you are. And, you know, if... If you think that you become a Christian and you're never going to sin again, you're in a world of hurt because th this is going to just shock you to death because it's very powerful and the influence of that is very powerful. And so this struggle is, is, is really a, a, an important struggle to deal with. And I'm not saying, you know, you read your Bible, read the Bible a day for, and the devil will go away or something. I don't know what, what you... Say about that. We need to read the Word of God to fellowship with Him. We need to read, open up our Bible and say, Heavenly Father, please teach me what I need to know from the Word today. I want you to teach. You be the teacher. You teach me. I need to know. I need to learn more about you. I need to know more about what, who you are and what you want me to do and how you want me to do it. That's this part. Depending upon God, reading the Word, prayer, and I like to pray, pray all by myself. I like to pray about things when they come to my mind during the day. And I think sometimes, if you, if you only do that, I th that's not, for me, that's not, I don't like that. Just having sort of prayers that just, you know, I was, you know, you think of Matthew having surgery today. And every time I think about him, I say, Lord, please help Matthew to, make it through this surgery and get through and please heal his body and amen. I think that's the way you pray all day long, but I like to be all by myself with the Lord for a little a while to pray to him and talk to him and not be hurried by traffic and other distractions and everything else. At the same time, I think those, those prayers are all prayers to God. But this, you have to deal with who you are. And if you're being conformed to the world, if you're being, if you're being led astray by Satan, if your flesh is leading you to follow your desires, you, you know, you look at that and you say, well, maybe I'm not a Christian. When you say that, and you go, nah, you know, and the way I draw it is, I've drawn it before. I just said there's, there's times every day when, when really what we look like is more like this. I can't draw it with that pen. We look more like this. And we want to look more like, like we should. Just We want to look more like that. But the truth is we look like both of these things you know, at different times during the day. Uh, you know, and, and that's sort of a vivid picture, but it's just, you never, this never stops, and this never stops, but this never stops either in the Christian life. And you don't come to the place where you say, well, I know how to deal with sin, so I don't sin anymore. I don't know that we ever come to that point, at least I've never have in living the Christian life, and I th you know, the, our dependence upon God is something that God delights in. Our dependence upon God is something that he delights in. 
for any and every issue in all of life, large and small. And we tend to bring our big issues to God. We don't bring our little issues to God because we think we can handle them. We ought to bring the big ones and the little ones, everything to God. The more we depend upon God, the better off we are. And God is quite happy when we say, I cannot, only you can. You know, and I, I love when Moses, you know, when the Lord says, well, you're going to go, you're going to take the children to the, up to the promised land. And Moses said, said the effect, I'll go if you go. I'll go if you go. Because if you don't go, it's, it's a waste of time. If, if, if you don't go and it's just me going, you know, you can tell Moses had learned a lot when he made that, that statement, I'll go if you go. That should be our attitude too. Well, we'll stop there <clears throat> because the clock talks to me. It doesn't really talk to me, but let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are always faithful. We're thankful that we are absolutely dependent upon you. And when you tell us how to live the Christian life, you don't tell us how to go and live the Christian life. You tell us how to live the Christian life with you, by you, for you, to the glory of you, God. And so we thank you for our dependence upon you. I thank you for showing us our weakness that we may see your strength. And we pray that you will continue to show us the things that only you can accomplish. We pray for our world. We pray for our country. And we pray that you will shine the light of your truth into this world of darkness that Christ may be vividly seen. And many people come to a saving knowledge of Christ. And help us to depend upon you more and more. And lead us by your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.